Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you for the Academy for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure. And uh, while they are putting the slides, uh, it has been really uh, very inspiring to see that all the speakers yesterday and today have mentioned forest, trees, or wood. So this is very encouraging, being a, a forest scientist. But uh, today I would like to, to share a few reflections and also a few facts on the important transformational role of our forest, sustainable forest management, and forest-based solutions in rethinking our economy, in rethinking the Anthropocene or the Urbanocene, as Professor West was mentioning yesterday. So it would be nice if they put the slides now. Yes, thank you. So let's start from the, from the very beginning. And the fact is that before trees and forests emerged in our planet, our planet was 10 degrees Celsius warmer than it is now, and it has 10 times the CO2 levels as we have today. So basically, our forest transform literally our planet and make it habitable for humans. Yeah, and this is because trees are amazing living organisms that use solar energy to absorb CO2, transform it into biomass, and at the same time they release oxygen and water in the vapor format. And this has a, an important cooling effect and also it changes the carbon balance of the planet. So forests make our planet habitable for human, and no wonder that we have the tree of life as a very important archetype in many religions, cultures, many parts of the world, eh? because tree is the fundamental source of life. Also, forests support life beyond its own boundaries, eh? because this uh, important role that they have in hosting biodiversity and having an impact, a, posit a positive impact in the water and the carbon cycle. So they transform the planet once, and now forests are called to transform again the urbanocene to make our planet habitable for the future. And this is crucial because after relying for more than 150 years in a linear and fossil economy, our world has become too big for our planet. We, we are reaching a tipping point. And in fact, the multidimensional crisis that we are seeing today, the climate, the biodiversity, the inequality, the health crisis, are not different crises. They are just different consequences of the same fundamental problem, which is our, ecosystem, our economic system. A system, remember, that is not only addicted to fossil resources, but also to growth at all costs. An economic system that fails to value our most important capital and the basis for human health and well-being, which is nature. So basically, having arrived at such tipping point, we should probably remember the words of Albert Einstein, who used to say that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. And this is exactly what we need now, a new way of thinking as basis for a new economic paradigm. But I believe that one component of rethinking our economic paradigm needs to be rethinking the way we measure the success of our economy, how we measure progress. Yesterday, many of the speakers were me mentioning progress, but I think we don't have a clear definition of what is progress. And I believe that GDP is not a measure of progress. In fact, Kuznets, the economists that developed the concept, already in the 30s in the American Congress mentioned, let's be careful with the use of GDP, because it's not a measure of welfare or, or progress. It just measures the amount of products and services multiplied by the price, and is a, basically a measure of consumption. Robert Kennedy in the 60s already said that GDP measures everything except that matters in life. I think it's a, it's a good definition. And, uh, and the problem with GDP is that the measure has become the target. And I think we are trapped in this vicious circle because at the end you manage what you measure. Yeah? And here in this graph, I, I just wanted to show you, this is a, a graph produced by, by the economist Constanza, uh, comparing the GDP in the last decades with another indicator, the genu genuine progress indicator, which is basically a GDP adjusted for social and natural capital. So if you measure progress with this uh, genuine progress indicator, you will see that the, our world has been in recession since the 70s. So you see how it matters, how we define progress. 
because maybe we have not been so progressive in the last decades after all. So I just wanted to put this uh, as, as a comment because yesterday we, we discussed uh, a lot about that and I think we didn't touch uh, enough the issue of consumption eh? and the fact that we are really addicted to consumption and we have built an economy centered around consumption. And now what is next? I believe that cities, which are our main economic and innovation hubs, but they are also our main consumers of resources, energy, and food. They have a responsibility to, need the tra to, to lead the transition to a new economy, an economy where life, remember that bio means life, where life and not consumption becomes its true engine and purpose. This is what some of us call the circular bioeconomy. Eh? A circular bioeconomy, to me, is an economy that prospers in harmony with nature, but powered by nature. And this is not a contradiction, but to me, is a necessary condition, because at the end of the day, we need to restore harmony between humanity and nature. We need to reconnect back to nature. So a circular bioeconomy, and here I want to add my forest pers perspective to the previous speakers, it's basically an economy that uses renewable energy and manages sustainably our biological systems in a holistic way to produce in a synergistic way food, energy, ecosystem services, bio-based solutions to decarbonize our economy while creating new jobs and prosperity. But for me, it's fundamental also to recognize that a circular bioeconomy is ultimately powered by biodiversity because biodiversity is the insurance of life to adapt and evolve in a changing environment. As you mentioned, John, before, we have been obsessed with efficiency, and I think our complex systems shows that everything is about resilience. And without biodiversity, we don't have resilience. So a circular bioeconomy should place biodiversity at, at its center, as the, as the prosperity engine. It is also important to recognize that a bioeconomy is much more complex than a fossil economy because our living systems are complex by nature. And this means that a circular bioeconomy to succeed needs to be knowledge intense, which also means not only science. We need to tap on the indigenous knowledge, ancestral knowledge, which is ab abundant. It should be innovation driven also because we need to really think outside the box in the, in the current context. But this complexity brings also an opportunity, because if you look how biological resources are owned, distributed, managed, and processed compared to fossil resources, you will see that they are more complex and therefore more costly. But at the end of the day, they offer you an opportunity to distribute jobs, infrastructures, beauty in the territory in a nicer way. So if we do the governance right, it is an opportunity to address inequality. So circular bioeconomy, by the fall and the previous speaker from New Zealand mentioned, it provides an opportunity to address inequality in a, in a very nice way. And finally, it's not about knowledge and science. We need to be wise. So this is why we need to use a circular principle. Eh? Reuse, recycle, repair, and reduce consumption. So I think this, these are four important principles when talking about a circular bioeconomy and also about sustainable forest management and a forest economy. Let's talk a bit about forest now. We have been uh, uh, hearing a lot of discussions about forest and trees during the last days. Forests are central for transitioning from a linear fossil economy towards a circular bioeconomy. Why? They are our most important biological infrastructure in the planet. Yeah. And this is not only because they cover 31% of the land area, 4 billion hectares, but basically for what I mentioned before, forests are the cities of nature, trees are the buildings of nature. They host most of the terrestrial life in our planet, 80% of the biological diversity, but they are also our largest terrestrial carbon sink and the main terrestrial source for precipitation and oxygen. Nowadays, with the latest, latest scientific tools, you can see the rainfall from where it is coming from through isotopes. You can see, for example, that uh, most of the rain in China comes from Siberian forests. You can also see that rainfall uh, in uh, Argentina or southwest United States is coming from the Amazon forest. So our forests also are crucial for food security, and they have a transcontinental 
implication in that sense. This is our forest garden, John. This is basically uh, the state of the world forest. You can see that these 4 billion forests we have in the planet, 33% are primary forests, which by the way, they are not untouched forests as we believe in, in the Western society. There are indigenous people living there, by the way, which have been managing these forests for thousands of years in a sustainable way, you know, following ecological principles. So this is also very important to remember because we think when we talk about primary forests that basically they are untouched. No, no, as Ana Maria mentioned the other day, they, they are highly anthroponized, but they have been used very wisely for thousands of years. Then we have forest plantation, 7% of the world forest, which provide more than 35% of the round wood in the world. They are important in avoiding, in avoiding that we extract eh, from the natural, the primary forest. And then we have 60% of the world forest that are so-called semi-natural, and they are managed under different types of intensity. And many of these forests are also abandoned eh, after the urbanization of the last decades. You know, forest surface, for example, I will show you later, has increased substantially in Europe, for example, and in other parts of the, of the world. Let me summarize a few challenges and opportunities for sustainable forest management at the global level. First of all, deforestation is still a huge problem. We are losing still an average of 10 million hectares every year. This is a lot. And remember that 70% of deforestation is driven by agriculture. 40% by industrial agriculture, eh? and 30% more or less is related to shifting agriculture. So unless we don't address the food issue, we will not address the deforestation problem. If we would avoid deforestation, we would be avoiding John 3.5 billion uh, tons of CO2 every year. So it's a substantial impact for the climate. Another challenge opportunity is to protect the primary forest, as I mentioned before. Eh? But let's, let's remember that what we need to do is to respect indigenous uh, communities and empower them, just help them, respect them. They are the main, the main host for biodiversity in our planet terrestrially. Restoration, the previous speaker have, have addressed this topic perfectly. Just to mention here that as, as Tony mentioned, restoration reforestation challenge is not so much about trees, it's about people. Eh? Many reforestation programs in the world have failed because they believe that planting the tree is the end of the project and it's just the beginning. And if we don't empower the local communities and they don't see the economic, social, and environmental benefits, it will not work. You might plant trees, they will be gone. So you need to provide the tools, the, the necessary uh, knowledge to the local communities so that they will be the ones that will benefit and, and immediately connect restoration, reforestation with value change, okay? so that there will be a, a, a market also powering this. Sustainable forest management and adaptation. We are seeing increasingly that many of our forests are arriving to a tipping point, and this is very worrying. The impacts of climate change and natural disturbances are destroying many of our forests. I give you an example. The Canada's forest for the last 20 years have been emitting CO2 rather than sequestering due to forest fires and the impacts of bark beetles. Germany, John, you see increasingly problems of forest fires in Sweden. So, you know, we are, this is becoming a tipping point. And the problem with the impacts of climate change in our forest is not what we know already, but especially what we don't know because of this nonlinearity of, of our systems. So we need a lot of investments in forest management and adaptation. And here, it requires an economy behind, because public funds are not enough for the scale of management actions and adaptation that we need in the future. We need also the private sector. This is why a circular bioeconomy is so important to support all this work. And finally, is the transformation to use wood and other forest resources for the right purposes. Okay? And here, the good news is that with the new science and technology of the last uh, years, we can currently transform wood resources into a totally new range of bio-based solutions. And I think our colleagues from New Zealand already mentioned many, many different uh, alternatives. I will just cover three, three important ones. An obvious one is the, the potential of wood in transforming 
decarbonizing the building construction sector. This got stuck now. Yeah, here. Okay, this has been addressed already by many speakers, and you have already seen during the last uh, during the last uh, uh, two days that wood is the only significant construction material, together with bamboo, that can be grown sustainably. And using wood is basically important because you avoid high carbon emissions compared to concrete and steel. For every ton of wood that you use, you are avoiding 2.5 tons of CO2 compared to concrete. But this is not the only advantage. When you use a cubic meter of wood engineering products, you are storing a ton of CO2. So the fact that you are transforming cities into carbon storage infrastructures. But there is another issue that has not been mentioned, and is the fact that the steel and concrete uses around 50 billion of resources per year. Half of the resources we extract from our earth are for the building construction sector, and we are running out of sand also. So it has also a lot of impacts in biodiversity. Using wood, it has an advantage because you can follow industrial prefabrication methods, which are easier to make this sector circular. I wanted to say a few words about the fashion industry because uh, President Ursula von der Leyen mentioned the... Okay, fashion industry is also one of the main, uh, you know, uh, offenders of our, of our economy, responsible for 4 to 8% of the global carbon emissions, 35% uh, of all the microplastics, and this is because it relies on polyester, 65% of our textiles, Cotton is also not very sustainable because it uses a lot of per pesticides, fertilizers, etc. So wood can be the solution. And we have now the technology to transform wood into sustainable textiles with a carbon footprint of between five to six times the carbon emissions of polyester. But again, the problem of fashion is not only the raw material, but the fact that the consumption is accelerating. And look at this data. You know, an average person uses now 60% more clothes than 15 years ago, but they are using them half what they were used, okay? Let me just go to the final conclusion, because we don't have time for that. Basically, I wanted to, to show you also that we can enhance biodiversity through ancient methods that have been used for thousands of years and mimicking natural disturbances. But my final reflection, I had the chance this year, this year to spend uh, several days living in the middle of the Amazon with indigenous communities in Ecuador. By the way, I, I explained this to Ana Maria with the Ashuar indigenous communities. It was very inspiring because in the Amazon, I saw two walls colliding, uh, a dying wall, uh, extractive, fossil base, the mining industry, the gold, uh, the gold uh, mining industry destroying literally the Amazon. And then I saw a totally different world when you enter the Amazon and you meet the indigenous communities, a, a world full of respect for nature, full of respect, very knowledgeable about all the plants, the uses, how the, the extraction rate of using timber and plants following ecological principles. But above all, I, I could see that this knowledge is translated into wisdom. And I think this is what is missing in the Western World. And this is why, uh, Professor West, uh, yesterday I asked you about this question that cities are fantastic in creating technology, innovation, but just to solve problems that we are creating ourselves. And I think here what I learned is that they are wise enough not to create problems. Here in the so-called modern civilized world, which I don't know if we should call it like this, we are very good at creating technology for solving the problems that we are creating. And therefore, let me just finish with a quote from Isaac Asimov. And this is quite a rather, uh, rather old quote, but I think it's valid today even more, that uh, the challenge we are facing is that, yes, we produce a lot of science, but we are not translating that into, into wisdom. And I think this is something that maybe here in the academy also, and we should be able to reflect how we translate this into, into wisdom. Thank you very much. <laughs>